Hi guys, welcome to my video. Um, this video, I'm just going to show you um, some of the photos that I took while I converted the garage. Uh, it's a single garage and it's part of the house. So it's probably um, a bit easier than most. Um, it's already got a double skin uh, in the wall and there's already some insulation in there. However, I did put a lot more insulation in when I converted it. Uh, this is just a picture of me taking the garage door off. Uh, the actual garage door broke, so it was a good opportunity to finally push me to try and convert the garage. And what I was after was more of an office, um, so the kids could play the computer games and things uh, in this particular room. There is actually an internal door into the house, but it's actually slightly smaller than a conventional door, so it's not quite as wide. So you probably need to... Um, uh, make note of that if you're going to do something similar because you can only get certain things in the garage through that door because it's a little bit smaller than normal. Uh, this actual garage door, the spring went on it so it was time to uh, start my conversion as it were. Um, before I started the conversion I sort of measured the bricks along the bottom to make sure the bricks on the left side were in line with the bricks on the right side because I wanted the brickwork cutting in to the original bricks uh, I didn't want a line going uh, down either side where you could tell where the, um, the new bricks were to the old bricks as it were so basically I drilled all the rivets out the door uh, took the spring off it uh, all these extra reinforcing pieces I took away um, and I basically folded it all up put it in the car and took it to the skip Uh, here you can see the garage slab itself so basically the, the concrete you can see here is like a floating slab that um, isn't actually connected to anything i.e. it's floating it was approximately six inches thick uh, and you can see here that it's been protected from the water coming through there's like a plastic sheet on the underside my initial thoughts were I could build directly on top of this floating slab um, because the wall that's going on here wouldn't be that heavy and all it's supporting is the weight of the window itself however the building regulations people didn't like that idea uh, one thing to note you want to try and get the buildings inspector in before you start the job they'll want to see uh, the job before you start the job and agree with them exactly what you're going to do before you do it otherwise you'll end up uh, having to do the job twice Right, so <clears throat> what actually happened was uh, they didn't allow me to build on top of the floating slab. Now the slab was six inches and it was reinforced. Um, so what I had to do is I had to cut the original slab back about 500 millimeters through the reinforcement, uh, take all that concrete away, dig down approximately a meter deep uh, and then put some foundations in for the new wall to sit on. So what I actually did was I got a, a quote from a builder um, to supply the window, to cut the slab uh, and to build the inner and outer wall and do the foundation. Uh, and that came to £2,000. In the end I'll go through uh, all the costs that it cost me to do this job. Uh, and doing it yourself you can save quite a lot of money. So here we've got a, a picture, uh, the foundation's been dug, the slab's been cut. It actually took the builder a good day to cut through the slab. It was an absolute job and a half to cut through the slab. Dust everywhere, they had to hire tools, they used a Kango in the end, um, and some big cutting discs. So it was a hell of a job, very, very noisy, Vi vibrations everywhere. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm glad I got them in to do that particular job. <clears throat> I'm also glad that I got them to supply the window because um, what that meant was I didn't get any delays from the people supplying the window and they did all the measurements for the window. I wanted a full width window uh, and the window was to fit between this pillow and this pillow. Because the garage is quite long and thin, 
you want as much light at the other end as possible so I fit a full width window in between pillow to pillow basically and you want approximately 10 millimeters clearance total uh, between the two edges <clears throat> one of the things that um, where I struggled the builder originally said, yeah, they'll find the right bricks and all the rest of it. It's not going to be a problem, etc., etc." Uh, but when they come to do the actual wall, they couldn't find the bricks to match the house. They said um, they don't supply them anymore. They don't make them anymore, etc., etc. And they gave me a couple of alternatives. These are some of the alternatives. And I didn't know as much about brickwork. Uh, then as I do now I've actually built uh, walls before and whatever in the past myself um, however you know there's there's a lot of um, different types of bricks out there a lot of different patterns a lot of different colors um, and it's quite visible visually different between one brick and the next the next brick and being on the front of the house I didn't want the wrong bricks so in the end, I had to do the research myself and find the bricks myself and tell the um, builder where to go and get them from, which is what I did. So these were the actual bricks for the house. Uh, it took quite a lot of looking to try and get the right ones, um, but these were actually the right ones in the end. And I found a place in Thermiston that actually um, we're doing the, 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 these particular bricks and we could actually buy them from this place in Thermiston which was good. <clears throat> you can see here we're um, starting to uh, to build the brickwork. Obviously, you know, in the past I've built walls myself, uh, but some of the finer detail, because it's in the actual house itself, uh, it's probably better off to get a proper um, brick layer in that does this job day in, day out, because they'll do all the right things in the right places, which is what you want. And here you can see uh, the internal brickwork. There's some sort of plastic he's got around the bottom layer of bricks uh, to make sure the damp can't come up. And there's a damp proof course at the same location on the outer bricks. There's also uh, going down here, some ties. So these ties are drilled into the inner um, wall and then the inner wall is tied in to the um, existing brickwork. There's like these little metal brackets which go from uh, the wall into the mortar joint of the new wall that's being made and you can see here that they're putting in some insulation in the uh, in the cavity i've actually put a lot more insulation at the front as well here you can see i pulled out the um uh, the drains at the front uh, later on actually actually i had to take some material uh, away off the drive to be able to get these back in uh, which was a bit of a pain. Here you can see um, just where the inner wall is, the tying pieces are here, and this is one of the brackets that go in the mortar joint. And they're tying in the new brickwork with just uh, standard ties, which, which is what you normally do. So here you can see it's all full of insulation. It's not the same insulation that I've used in the rest of the, uh, the build. I don't think this insulation is quite so good as the PIR insulation, but it's what the bricklayers tend to use when they're um, when they're putting these little metal ties through. I think it's uh, a lot easier to get the metal ties in when it's this sort of insulation. Here you can see. Uh, this is where the um, the drain was. <clears throat> There's actually a, a drain hole here and a drain in the middle of the drive, um, and any water coming on the off of the uh, driveway goes into a drain here somewhere, um, and then goes into the the main drain. Just be careful when you're cutting through the concrete itself because. Uh, in my case, there was pipes going in, in and out of the house at that location. So uh, you have to be very, very careful not to go through them pipes or damage them pipes. One of them is the soil pipe coming out, but there's also the water pipes going, going into the house at the same location. So you need to be very, very careful at this location. 
um, the new wall, this, this brickwork is sitting on the new wall that's been built or the new uh, foundation that's been built. Um, you have to bridge over uh, this pipe work here and you buy these concrete lintels and then you brickwork on top of the concrete lintels. <clears throat> the buildings inspector will want to see after you've dug the actual hole to make sure the depth is okay um, and he'll want to see um, when you come to put the damp proof course in he'll, he'll want to make sure that damp proof course has gone in um, you can see here that the brickwork at the bottom is engineering bricks and as the engineering bricks stop and it goes into the normal brickwork that's where your damp proof course will be and also at the top of the wall I wanted the uh, builder to match the existing brickwork uh, underneath the windows so underneath the windows at the minute the bricks are turned in the other direction uh, I think they're called soldiers in this direction but you can see here um, they don't go this way they go this way and that matches the rest of the house I just thought it would uh, it'd be good to match the rest of the house in the brickwork was actually very very difficult to do before we started the uh, job I made sure that the bricks on this side of the house were lining up with the bricks on this side of the house uh, but there's a few things you don't spot uh, one thing that was a bit strange um, the number of bricks are from this end to this end didn't actually work out very well um, and what that meant was we couldn't get the same number of bricks all the way across so the builder actually cut the middle ones for me so I've actually got you can't really tell when you look from the outside but the middle rows of bricks there's actually two three quarter bricks that have been cut um, all the way up because the distance from this side and this side didn't work out quite right which was a bit of a pain also the um, the original brickwork on this side was pointing out a bit and on this side it's pointing in a bit which makes lining it up quite difficult so there are some bricks where there's a little bit of um, yeah, it's not quite so smooth um, where it joins because of that but there's not a lot you can do you can just see it at this location here where it sort of stands out a little bit this brick here you can probably just see it here this brick and this brick are the original bricks and these ones are new ones and the brickwork's actually pointed in a bit at this location so you've got a bit of um, depth here uh, it's not bad but um, yeah it could have been better but it's because the original brickwork here is pointing in and here it's pointing out a fraction but it's just how the original house was made it's not a lot you can do you can just see in the middle here um, the three quarter bricks but it's difficult to see you don't see them unless you know they're there okay so we've got the window in uh, I've got the builder to supply the window as I said before and that was really good because it saves all the hassle of you trying to get and organize the window to turn up and make sure it's ready on time and all the rest of it and basically the, the builder just put a couple of screws going through here and a couple of screws going through here and I did all the rest I put all the foam behind it all around it etc and finished it all off right so we've got the um, the inside um, whew, originally the um, buildings inspector wanted me to put sand down on top of the concrete slab to level it what most people don't realize is the garage floors actually sloped out of the garage slightly and it's quite significant it's probably a good 50 millimeters or so probably even more um, so what that means is it's the grounds higher at this end than it is closer to where the garage door is so if you drop oil on your garage floor the oil would roll out the garage or yeah drip out the garage basically um, that makes it quite awkward with putting a flat floor in and there's a number of ways of doing this um, I could have actually put the walls in first and put the walls directly on the concrete floor I chose to put the flooring first and then the walls coming down and just off the floor instead uh, but there's a number of ways of doing it I chose to build a wooden floor and I think that's personally the better way of doing it um, however it is a bit of a pain cutting all the wood now luckily enough I got 
couple of decent saws so cutting the wood wasn't really a problem but basically what we've got is it's better to take the the taper out over the width rather than the length if you try and do it over the length you'll find a long piece of wood uh, is not very straight so you'll find if it's touching here it'll probably be three inches up in the air at the other end because it's so long so you're better off cutting it width ways and doing it width ways so what I've done here uh, I've started with a certain height here and then I've gone slightly higher on the next one slightly higher on the next one slightly higher on the next one to take the taper out over the length of the carriage floor so what I've done is um, these pieces in between they start off at say 50 millimeters this end but then this end of it is matching this size so if this end was 50 mil this end might be 60 millimeters for example <clears throat> so what that means is you have to cut all of these between 50 and 60 mil between 50 and 60 mil and then I basically made up that piece put it in then made up the next piece and attached it to it uh, and I've offset these slightly so I can just drill through <clears throat> you do need to put this plastic down um, and the building inspector will want to see that plastic sheet the damp proof membrane to make sure you've got no um, damp coming through the floor but like I said before under the underside of the concrete itself has got something similar already so yeah um, but to pass the building's inspection you'll need this uh, polythene sheet down and you'll want to see it also where you have to join it um, I overlaid it by pool three or four foot you know, at certain locations and then you have to tape it wherever you've cut it you need to tape it some of these joints here aren't joins they're just um, creases in the in the sheet the joins are over here somewhere and there's probably ones down here uh, with regards to the screw holes as you can see here I've probably put three screws in, in on each one uh, I prefer to screw everything rather than nailing things I just think it's a bit better uh, and I tend to use three rather than two probably a bit over the top but uh, I know it's not going to go anywhere <clears throat> okay so you can see probably better at this end that it's smaller here than it is here uh, and these pieces are all tapered to match and what that means is it's taken out the, the taper over the length the um, there was insulation placed in between um, the floor and all, and all these places here uh, and the insulation went from 50 millimeters on the left hand side to 100 millimeters depth on the right hand side I didn't actually take a photo of it though unfortunately so I'm looking in from the inner door at the minute I did actually take this step away but I kept the actual original door and the fact that it opens in this direction rather than opens in. It's quite difficult opening in when I've got this wall right next to it, so I left it opening out. This was um, some of the Kingspan I used, the PIR insulation. Um, generally speaking, I bought 70 millimeters thickness for most places. Uh, but I did buy a combination of 100 millimeters, 70 millimeters, uh, 30 millimeters, and various other sizes. Right, so I bought some OSB3 for the actual floor itself, um, and I used a combination of screwing and gluing. So you can see the different sheets have gone down here. You've got one, two, three. Uh, and the joins are where the beams are underneath uh, to make sure it's solid and I've put screws in but I've also glued it where them beams are uh, and that's made quite a significant difference with the fact that the floor doesn't squeak at all and it feels more almost like a, a concrete floor there's no noise or, or anything which is what I wanted this is just looking in the other direction this is actually the soil pipe coming from uh, upstairs to downstairs and it goes underneath the floor and out of the drain through that uh, pipe you can see at the front right you can see the um, 
electrics that I put in. I put in four double sockets on this wall because it's going to be used as a computer room. Um, it seemed to make sense. This outside wall is not ideal to uh, try and tack cable directly to, which is what I've ended up doing. Um, and in certain locations, these hold quite well, and in certain locations, they don't hold very well at all. So in key locations, what I actually did was uh, I drilled a 9.5 millimeter hole into the wall at a certain depth, and then I um, push fit a 10 millimeter dowel into it. Uh, and then I used the dowel, the wooden dowel, uh, for the pin and hammered the, uh, the pin into the center of the dowel. And that held really, really well. So at key locations, that's what I did to make sure that this doesn't all come off the wall later on. You can see from inside of the house uh, to the new room. Um, one thing you need to try and do is you need to try and match the height of the new room to, to here. Um, I think if I came to do this again, I might actually start at this location. I actually measured it and then measured back. Uh, but I was slightly high with the new floor compared to the existing floor. Plus I've put carpet down and underlaid down, which lifts the height up even more than, than this side. Uh, overall, it came out about 15 millimeters too high this side compared to this side. So yeah, it might be better off starting at this location. Take this step away first and then get your levels right. Yeah, so here I've just put the cabling in, ready to go to the consumer unit. Uh, we've got this cable here. Now this actual cable, if you've seen one of my previous videos, was when I did the shed. Um, I put the electrics to the shed, and this cable is actually the armor cable coming through the outside of the house to the consumer unit. I didn't want to connect, uh, connect it to anything, so I wanted to run the armor cable directly to the consumer unit. Uh, that way there's no joins in it. Uh, but what it means now is I've got to uh, make sure the insulation is cut away that, to miss this cable and to miss this cable. Right, so uh, I've started to build up the framework. Uh, again, there's different ways of doing this. Um, you could make the framework and then put it to the wall. What I've done is because I've built the floor first, I've made sure that these beams are at absolutely fraction off so they're a couple of millimeters off this floor so none of it none of the wall studs are sitting on this new floor because it's all wood it all moves a little bit i thought i'd just use the wall to hold the studs in place and because it's a it's a strong wall that's there already uh, i thought that's the best way of doing it so i put quite a few screws going through uh, into this wall from the studs all the way along and then i did the same on these pieces here and i actually screwed uh, them across here and screw these into here so it's all connected I put some cutouts in here to miss the uh, electric cables as you can see here one thing I did notice in certain locations the brickwork actually goes away from you uh, where the, the, the wall is not very straight so in them locations, I put some shims underneath before screwing through to make sure that the outside is straight. Otherwise, you'd pull this and, and bow it in, which is not what I wanted. <clears throat> you can actually see this um, box here. So the armor cable actually goes to this box here. So I t uh, terminated the armor cable, the earthing to this box, and then ran a cable from there into the consumer unit. Got the electrician to do that bit. Um, and the normal cable comes through into this location, the armor is stripped away, and then the core goes through in, in, into the consumer unit. So again, there's no joins in the, in the cable uh, from here all the way to the shed. You can see here, I've put another button in here, and the cable's going up with a cutout in it going through. And again, I've used the dowel trick in certain locations, so probably here, 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 anywhere where uh, the cable was coming off the wall where if you pulled it you could pull the clip off um, so in these locations I would have used that dowel trick when you're putting your cables in you need to make sure that they're in the um, um, 
right location. You can't have them going up at 90 uh, angles or anything. They need to be uh, in line with where you put in the, the, um, the sockets. Basically what I did was I had a word with an electrician before I did the job, made sure he was happy with the way I was going to do it, got him on board so um, he could sign it off and give me the proper paperwork. The buildings inspector will ask for that paperwork before he signs the building off. Okay, you got a, I've got a gas pipe coming through. Uh, the gas box is on the other side of the wall. Uh, and obviously you've got a gas pipe here. So here where we've got the window, uh, I'm putting some battens and things in. Uh, and there's a piece of wood I put along here, screwed it to the wall um, for the plasterboard to sit on. So <clears throat> at this location, basically what the depth of the insulation is being set by is actually the distance from the front face of this to this wall. That's sort of the height I've got because I wanted to plasterboard directly up to the window. If you notice here, uh, there's sort of a metal box. This, uh, this actually lets air in um, through here and it's quite difficult to um, uh, get a plasterboard on there properly. Uh, but I'll go into that in a bit more detail in a minute. Again, I've just um, battened out the front of the wall now, uh, waited till this all went off properly before uh, drilling into it. And basically the, um, the depth here was 35 millimeters. And the reason I've uh, chose 35 millimeters is so I can get some decent screws into it for the plasterboard, but also so I can put some insulation in this front as well. So I've got insulation in the cavity and I'm gonna put insulation in here as well. I didn't know in this particular location whether there's actually cavity wall insulation behind this wall or not, but I suspect there is. Um, but the building's inspector wanted to be used to me to use as, as as thick an insulation as I can get in here anyway. So I've sort of done both. Right, so the plasterboard is going to come up to this location here and across here. I've also made the studding so it's about the same height as the top of the brickwork. So when I put the uh, the shelf on here, it all lines up nicely and I should just bond it to both. Um, and also the plasterboard is going to come along here and it's going to go on to this piece of wood here. So this is holding it at the extreme edges, which is where you want to be holding it really. Just um, showing roughly what it would look like, overall scale. Uh, so here you can see it's roughly in line with the top. This is the other side. Um, this is actually still considered an outer wall. So what I've done here is I've made this 35mm thick as well. So I'm going to put some insulation at this location as well. So insulation along the front and along this side. Uh, I did make a bit of a mistake here. Um, this piece of wood here, what I should have done is moved it back so this edge was in line with this edge. That way I would have had one piece coming straight across and straight across uh, and it would have looked better. Um, so this wanted to go further back really. So this edge was in line with this edge. You can see the tie in here as well for the, uh, for the brick wall. Um, and again, the building regs people all want to see that. At this location, you need to be a little bit careful drilling too close to the very edge of the block work. If you go too close to the edge of the block work, you'll end up breaking the brick off. So just uh, need to be a little bit careful there. And again, I've done the same down here. Um, Got this piece of wood to go into so there's a piece of uh, plasterboard going across here it will go in here and across initially i was going to make this wall so it was flush all the way along but um i think it pays off just to try and get as much space in here as possible so i thought well um i'll, I'll go in a fraction uh, 
Uh, on the inside of the house, so this is one of the inner block work. Uh, and if you look, the style of this block work is slightly different to the outer block work. And I don't think this is anywhere near as strong as the outer block work. Um, I think this is called Thermalite. Uh, and when you drill into it, it's like drilling into cheese. It's very, very soft. So uh, initially I tried to use the, black, the brown raw plugs. So I used the brown raw plugs on all the outer walls. And basically what I was aiming for is to keep it about 40 millimeters deep. So the raw plug is about 40 millimeters deep and I was aiming to get the screw to go into that 40 millimeters worth of depth into the wall. Um, in this particular location, the brown raw plugs didn't work very well. It's the first time uh, I've had problems with the brown raw plugs in any material. Uh, but yeah, if I, I tried it in here originally, put a piece of um, stood on and literally just pulled it straight out of the wall. So it wasn't very strong at all. And I use some special raw plugs for this, which I'll show you later. Again, this is the inner wall, a bit more framing. Right, so I used um, Kingspan. This is a 70 millimeter thick Kingspan uh, insulation, PIR. And basically what I've done here, I've, I've taken a piece out for the um, electrical socket uh, I've used like a plastic type and the actual um, plasterboard locates the actual socket itself. And here you can see I've taken a piece out for the uh, electrical cable to run down. Uh, at this location, this is what I tried first. This wasn't actually quite wide enough. And in the end, I, I actually start, started to make it the same width as the box. So I moved this line out to here. Uh, in both locations but this ensures that there's some insulation at this location as well um, so I think this was a reasonable solution again this is uh, one of the middle pieces and this is the same width as the actual um, socket itself to cut this out I used a combination of things um, I used a tenon saw and actually used a hacksaw blade to take a lot of it out uh, which was quite easy really bit messy though uh, at this location this is uh, I've cut this out specifically for the um, the cable for the shed the uh, armor cable for the shed um, and this goes over the top of that so I've not got little gaps all over the place it's just cut out of one piece and I thought this was probably the best solution that's another view of it as you can see here I've opened the the size of this cutout out to the same size as the, uh, the socket cutout Uh, and then basically I'm put, pushing these uh, Kingspan insulation into the gaps. The studding here is 75 millimeters deep and this is 70 millimeters uh, thick. So it fits in there quite nicely. I've just drawn some lines showing me where the, uh, the cables go here. And uh, the cables run obviously underneath. And here we've got the shed one coming in and it goes around. Got the consuming unit at the top and I've cut out the uh, Kingspan to go around the plastic box here. Um, obviously when you cut when you cut this piece here out the, the sides come in a fraction you can't really help that too much but I've taped all this up at the end of the day. Plus I think there's already insulation behind here anyway. And this room is actually now the uh, warmest room in the house, even though there's no radiator in there. So uh, I probably overdid it a little bit with the insulation anyway. You can see the cables coming out the top, ready to go into the consumer unit uh, for its 32 amp breaker.
got the gas pipe um, in the regulations you don't actually have to cover the gas pipe up uh, which is a bit strange really uh, you would have thought it would have needed a sort of a metal conduit or something to cover it but you don't actually need anything one thing you do have to do though is at the minute the gas pipes earthed at this location um, you do need to move the earthing point you need to be able to get to it later on and obviously if you put plasterboard over here you can't get to this location so you need to move it to a location that you can get to so what I've done uh, I've got a hole just here so I would have drilled it from the uh, the other side um, where the cable can come out and inside the actual box itself but the other side of the wall and the holes come down here ready for me to put the cable through the hole into the other side of the box and to terminate it on the um, on the um, gas pipe the other side. So all I've done here is just crimped it. Um, the actual cable, the earth cable, is quite thick. Um, a lot of the smaller crimps are different colours, like yellow, blue. Um, can't remember the other colour now. Red, I think. Um, but the thicker ones tend to be just um, sort of metal coloured. Uh, so it's quite a thick um, crimp that you need on this and you need uh, the bigger crimping tool to, to crimp it. So all I've done here, I've taken this cable off of this earthing point here and I've joined it to another piece of cable and I'm going to push that through the wall and earth it the other side. Just put some heat shrink on. And then I've just filled the gap up with uh, a bit more insulation that I've cut and I've put a smaller, thinner piece on top of the gas pipe. That's the other side. Filling all these little bits up. Anywhere where I had little tiny gaps, um, I've just filled that up with um, sort of the same insulation that goes in the cavity wall. I had a little bit of that knocking around. Um, I struggled to try and find anything on vapour barriers, whether it really needed a vapour barrier or not. I did a hole in a, an outer wall in the house um, a little while ago for a TV, to hang the TV onto the wall. Uh, and I put the holes in the plasterboard to put the cables down uh, from the top of the TV to the bottom of the floor. And in them walls, there wasn't any plastic or anything behind it. Strangely enough, the inspector didn't want me to or didn't need me to put any um, plastic in front of the walls. So I sort of went halfway house and I bought the uh, specific tape. Um, it's sort of this silver coloured tape. So really, uh, there is sort of a vapour barrier here because it's got the, the fascia of the Kingspan and all the wooden joints have been taped up as you can see. So it sort of does a bit of both. This is near the window. Some of it was quite difficult to tape up because it actually went in a little bit too far. Again, I've got the top here. This was quite difficult to cover because it was basically a metal box with air holes in it. So what I've done here, I've used a plasterboard with uh, PIR insulation bonded to the plasterboard already and I think it was about 20 millimeters thick so I've used a piece of plasterboard here and a piece of plasterboard underneath with the insulation already on it and I've bonded it to the metal box along the top here there was a piece of wood and I put some screws in going along the top just to hold it at the top and then bonded it to it uh, what I used to bond it to it was like um, an expanding foam uh, I did actually put a bit too much on there and it tried to push this top piece off as it expanded. So, um, yeah, you need to be, um, um, yeah, not, not, not try and put too much in there uh, when you're doing that. And I think it, it turned out quite well and it was quite a good solution in the end. And it's very, very strong, this um, bonding material, because you're using the whole surface area to bond it. So I put the Kingspan across the front and you can see, uh, I think what I did actually here, uh, I ended up cutting uh, some 70 millimeter into uh, sort of 35s or whatever to go in between here. And when I cut it, it actually sprung a little bit. And you can just tell there that 
it's going in a bit here and out a bit here but when I put the plasterboard on it pushed it back in just bonded the sill directly to the block work and the woodwork this was quite a difficult location for uh, the plasterboard the problem here I didn't have enough space to get the, the plasterboard on the wall really and again I used the plasterboard with a 20 millimeter um, PIR bonded insula um, insulation onto the plasterboard at this location the reality is I probably should have just bonded the plasterboard directly to the wall to give me that extra 20 millimeters of depth because I was struggling for depth here um, and it's very difficult to make this look a good job um, unless you've got the space so you can see here this is the existing wall this is the new wall and this wall sticking out fractionally more than this wall it sort of suggests that there's nothing behind this this is just plasterboard directly onto the block work this was the plasterboard um, some of the insulation underneath um, I think when you start the job you need to understand whether you, whether or not you're going to plaster the room or not now originally I was going to plaster the room so I bought all uh, standard square butt joint uh, plasterboard but in the end I didn't actually plaster it so this was a bit of a mistake and really I should have bought a different type of plasterboard this was actually the thicker 15 millimeter plasterboard which I think is a good thing because you can get away with bigger spacing for your um, woodwork but what I should have bought here is actually taper joints because to join taper joints is a lot easier because it actually tapers in a fractionally at the ends uh, you can then tape it and then you can build that gap up with um, uh, sort of a uh, plasterboard material and it, and it is a lot easier than trying to join it when the height is the same because the time you put your tape on you need, you need to build the surface up and you've got like a hump around it so it's a lot more difficult to do that and uh, there's one instance I didn't do a very good job of it and you can see still uh, where the, the shadows are the light, light and darkness uh, so I do need to go over that when I get some time and uh, take a bit more material off it see here I'm putting the plasterboards in and I've got these um, these boxes here uh, you just need to make sure that there's plenty of space behind it to get this box in um, I think I cut the plasterboard here I just put some holes in it and used uh, a knife standing knife or something just to cut it uh, you can also use the blade of a hacksaw which is which works quite well and then you've got these yellow tabs and the yellow tabs basically push in and pull forwards and that stops the box from moving and they're really really solid and these work quite well and then the fascia just goes directly onto this. You see roughly how many screws I put in. Probably a bit overkill really, but um, doesn't hurt having a few more. The actual screws I used here are 40, 42 millimeters uh, in length, and the plasterboard was 15 millimeters thick. And to cut the plasterboard, I basically used a tenon saw. Uh, there was a couple of little gaps um, after I put the plasterboard in where I could have done a slightly better job. And in them gaps, all I did was is fill them up with foam. This was the difficult bit. So because I got the wrong sort of plasterboard, uh, you have to build the surface up to hide the taping joints. I actually use sort of a plastic mesh taper taping joint. Um, and I think that was probably more difficult than a paper one as well because I think it was thicker. So maybe the paper one would have been easier. Um, I like the plastic type because you can stick it into place. Um, so I thought it was probably easier using that. 
I think for the corners though, the paper is better for the sort of joints we've got here. I think um, the plastic mesh is probably better. You need to tape all the joints up, otherwise, um, if you if you go and just put this uh, stuff across the top and then sand it all down and paint it, it will start to crack after you know a couple of months or something. So to stop it from cracking, you need to always tape the joints, and that means around the tops, you know, in the in the corners and where you've got any joints, basically. In the corners you need to put in um, sort of a metal corner piece so anywhere where you've got a corner you need to put in the metal corner piece and the metal corner piece sits a little bit proud so you have to build the material up around the corner metal pieces like I've done here and like I've done here as well so I've just built the corner up from this location to this location likewise the same the other way just so um, you've got no short sharp steps Out of all these joints that I did, there was only really one that weren't very good. Um, the rest weren't bad. So this one was pretty good. The one coming down here was pretty good. You couldn't really see uh, any differences when you look down it. But there was one down this side which wasn't very good, which I need to um, probably go over and sand again when I've got some time. Having a decent saw always helps. And this uh, Evolution one was very, very good. See, I've got a corner here again. So I put the metal piece in, and I've just been working my way up to it. Here, you see, I've painted the uh, wall, give it a first coat, and here you can see the new sockets that have gone in. So I got the electrician round. Um, before I started the job, I explained to him what I was going to do, how I was going to do it, and all the rest of it. Make sure he was happy with it. He wanted me to take some photos to make sure um, he was happy with the job after it was finished. Uh, so when the electrician got here, there's basically a gap here where the consumer unit is, a couple of wires hanging out, and there's some wires hanging out at these locations. He's put the fascias on and he's connected it up. And he, he, did, he did that within uh, about 40 minutes. This was the one I'm not happy with. I took a photo so you can see. Um, it's sort of a, a line you can see running down here. I think I can make this a lot better by taking some more material off. I've probably put too much stuff on it. Um, so yeah, it, need, it just needs sanding down a bit, I think. The window that I put in is a, is a full width window. You want to try to get a full width window in. Uh, you want as much light in there as possible. Just made a quick box going around the consumer unit uh, just to hide it basically. And this is actually a piece of plasterboard that I put on. Um, and underneath here it's just got a magnetic catch, so you just lift it off. Put some big hinges on. These are actually like fire hinges where you could lift this piece off if the ceiling wasn't there. Uh, and there's a magnetic catch here. But something very basic. Put some desks in for the computers. And the wife's got her shelves in for her books. This was um, the quote that I had originally. So from this, it's not worth trying to cut that slab initially yourself and do the foundations and do the brickwork it's just not worth all that hassle um, you know for them to do all that work they paid for the skip um, they paid for the window they sorted the window out and everything else and it was two thousand pound all in so it's not worth the hassle of trying to do it yourself um, i think that's quite good value overall you just need to make sure you get the right people on board um, and they fully understand you know this is what you want them to provide um, just try and make sure you know these people aren't going to spend a long time on one particular job if they can't find your brickwork you know they'll try and use whatever they can to get the job done um, but you don't want to compromise on something like that so it's probably wise to do a bit of research early on make sure you understand 
now it's these bricks and I can get them and I can get them from here so you can point them in the right direction so yeah the bricks can get from here you know make sure you use the right ones these were the um, screws I used for the plasterboard you can actually get a particular tool and the tool fits onto the end of the screw uh, when you screw it in it goes about two millimeters under the surface um, you know and it's the same every time however I didn't bother I just used um, my um, uh, Dewalt screwdriver as it were um, and just run my hand across the surface to make sure they were just on, just below the surface I didn't really have any problems um, if you're going to do this thing day in day out it's probably worth getting the proper tool I also used in certain locations 3 by 3.5 by 60s a lot longer uh, and I also used some smaller ones around the window where the uh, the framing wasn't anywhere near as thick These were the uh, raw plugs I used for the Thermalite blocks and these work really well. I did try quite a few different scenarios. I tried almost like concrete screws where you just drill straight through the, um, the woodwork and um, straight into the block work with the screw itself, but they didn't work very well and I, I could pull them out quite easy. Uh, I did try screwing straight into the block work without any raw plugs and again it wasn't particularly good these work really well really strong really impressed with them this was the tape i used for the um the drywall uh, and again it worked it worked pretty well this this tape uh, it was reasonably sticky i know some tapes aren't very sticky you put them on and then they come off and it's a bit of a nightmare so I think if I was going to plaster the place, I'd probably tape the joints as well. Uh, I think a, a top tip would be, uh, if you don't know what you're going to do, buy the taper joint plasterboard, uh, or most of the taper joint plasterboard, um, because that way you can put the tape in, tape the joints up anyway, and even if you go and plaster it it doesn't matter too much it just means you need to build plaster up in them locations of the joints a little bit more um but yeah i think i would do it that way and i think it would be a lot easier doing it that way going forwards so that's yeah what i would use next time around right i'll take you some into the into some of the costing uh, for doing the job right so all in it cost me five thousand six hundred pound to do the whole job but this this it does include the tables the carpets and, and other things so just looking down the list the uh, original deposit to the builder was a thousand pounds but various screws of various lengths what you're trying to aim for in the screw length is you want the uh, screw to match the length of the raw plug as much as possible when it's finished Um, basically you need proper tape for the um, damp proof membrane and I also got that from the tool station with the damp proof membrane as well it was only 30 odd pounds the building regulations cost me 353 pounds uh, and that includes something like I think they came around something like five times to see various locations just make sure you know uh, when them hold points are. They'll tell you when them hold points are and make sure you tell the builder, you know, you've got to wait for this, you've got to wait for that. Uh, in our case, I had a word with the builder um, and he knew the person um, involved in the building regs and they actually rang them up and sorted a lot of the uh, visits out. So that was quite handy. Again, some of these things um, you probably don't need. So looking at the, the cost to do the actual job, you're looking probably around £4,300, something along those lines, without the carpets and things. Uh, so the Celitex, or the, um, it wasn't actually Celitex, but same stuff, uh, and the plasterboard was £537. But yeah, next time I would get tape off. Uh, but various uh, drill bits and things. 
the aluminium foil tape. So the aluminium foil tape, I think, uh, worked really well. And I got that from Tool Station. Uh, various bits of water got from CBS Timber. I've even included the crimping tool here because I had to go out and buy it. But again, you can probably take these costs off if you've got these tools already. Uh, the electrician. So the electrician, he was only around here for about 40 minutes because uh, I'd already done most of the, um, the work. Um, I'd done basically what's called the first fix. Um, but I had to get him to come around, do the quote. Um, and overall it was quite good value. All in, it cost me £80 for the electrician. Uh, carpet, £500. Also got some chairs and things. Uh, and the furniture for uh, the computers. Yeah. So that's about it, guys. Um, hopefully you've took some uh, positives away. So if you're coming to do your conversion for your garage, uh, you can take some of these bits on board and hopefully uh, not make some of the little errors uh, that I made and hopefully take away all the good bits. Thanks for watching.